Hello and welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or add our RSS feed to your podcatcher of choice. You can also follow us on Twitter or Google+, and please give us feedback. You can leave a review on iTunes, send us a tweet or an email, leave us a message on Google+, or our show notes, or you can also join our community. Visit discourse.pythonpodcast.com for your opportunity to find out about upcoming guests, suggest questions, and propose show ideas. I'd like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. For details on how to support the show, you can visit our site at pythonpodcast.com. Linode is sponsoring us this week. Check them out at linode.com slash podcastinit and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for your next project. I would also like to thank Hired, a job marketplace for developers and designers, for sponsoring this episode of podcast.init. Use the link hired.com slash podcast in it to sign up and double your signing bonus. Your hosts as usual are Tobias Macy and Chris Patty. Today we are interviewing Corey Benfield and Andrew Godwin about a proposed update to the WSGI specification. So could you please introduce yourselves? Corey, how about you go first? Uh, sure. So I'm Corey Benfield. Uh, in my day job, I'm a senior cloud engineer at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I work in HPE's upstream team, which means that I basically get to spend my time working on Python open source projects that uh, HP doesn't know it needs yet. Uh, so I've been doing Python open source a long time now, five, six years, and mostly working on HTTP and Python. So that's been things like Python requests, where I'm a core developer, uh, along with URLib3. Uh, I also do a bit of TLS cryptography stuff on the side, uh, so I work on PyOpenSSL, and I try and help out with the Python cryptography project from time to time. And the thing I've been spending my, most of my time on recently, uh, aside from WSGI, is HTTP2 in Python. So I worked a bit with the IETF to help standardize HTTP2, and I've written a couple of Python HTTP2 implementations. Andrew, how about you? Yeah, so I'm Andrew Godwin. I currently work at Eventbrite as a senior software engineer, sort of wrangling our backend stack there. Um, but my sort of involvement with Python um, on the open source side is with Django. So I've been working with Django for about the last eight years or so. I'm a Django core developer these days. Um, previously, I've been working on stuff like Django's database uh, migration backends. And now I've turned to adding in much more native support for WebSockets to Django and stuff like that. I've had sort of a long history with HTTP stuff in Python in general. Um, most of my work with it has been web-based and I've used to do quite a lot of WebSocket stuff back when it was still being developed by Google, but it's now developed into sort of more full-on getting it into Django, making it work properly kind of angle. So how did you get introduced to Python? Let's start with Andrew this time. So my introduction to Python, I think it was around, I'd say, nine years ago at this point, perhaps, perhaps a bit, perhaps a bit um, early, later than that, actually. And so at the time I was doing PHP, like many people were at that point, um, and I stumbled across Turbo Gears, which at that time was, I'd say, probably the leading, if not one of the leading web frameworks around. And, you know, it's a sort of amalgam of different bits of Python glued together with some code. But it, it, it was similar. You know, it had templating, it had an RM, um, the RM's SQL object, which is very similar to Django's RM these days. And I sort of shifted from PHP to Python and doing Turbo Gears over the sort of a year or so. And then... I think it was 2000, summer 2006, I um, went to work with Simon Willison, who's one of the uh, co-founders of Django, as it were, and a very enthusiastic, if you know Simon, that's very much how he is, uh, six or seven weeks later, I was very much involved with doing Django stuff um, and had taken my turbo gears. So that's sort of my path into this kind of stuff. And then I accidentally became a core developer over the following years by developing stuff for Django that seemed important enough. People were sort of like, Andrew, you should probably, mm, yes. And so in the end, I sort of just got, ended up in this uh, position where I'm writing lots of core Django features. But it was a very sort of gentle road and PHP was definitely my sort of first language on the web, as it were. Uh, so I have a slightly less long and storied history than Andrew does, but uh, I did also come to Python from a different language, and I came to Python uh, perplexingly from Mathematica. So I picked up Python in uh, university where I'd started doing computational physics uh, as part of my undergraduate degree, which involved lots of writing Mathematica. And there's lots of great things you can do with Mathematica, but they're almost all maths. And 
uh, I wanted to do some programming in my spare time because programming was much, much more fun than actually studying. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, I needed to pick something up and I wanted to, to work with web APIs. And there were only so many things that were installed on my Mac at the time. Uh, and Python happened to be one of them. So uh, like any good university student, I was using the system Python on OS X, which I would not let my past self do <laughs> if I had to talk to myself now. Uh, and I started grabbing, uh, playing around with web APIs, which of course led me uh, directly and immediately to requests. And uh, from there, I, I started proposing patches uh, to requests for, for little things just to get involved and to get my, my hand in. And that kind of snowballed. And now I find myself here now without really knowing how I got here. <laughs> Haven't we all had gotten to that point? How did I actually get here? Yeah, it's it's confusing. Yes. I was going to say that I think the route, you know, the, the Mathematica to Python route is going to become less and less perplexing these days with all the excellent numerical and data science uh, tools that Python has, right? I mean, like, I'm sure that though back then that was kind of an unusual thing, I'm guessing it'll become more and more common. Oh, yeah, like without question. Uh, so so in university, I bought myself a student mathematical license because uh, I needed to, to work away from the computer lab because the computer lab was a hateful place. And uh, I now, with IPython Notebook and um, Maplotlib and all of NumPy and SciPy, I don't think I would have bothered. I think I would have been perfectly happy with IPython. So first off, what is WSGI? And some people may have heard it pronounced WSGI. Yeah, I pronounce it WSGI. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, I, I'll do a I'll do a bit of high level summary, and Andrew can just leap in if he thinks I'm um, misleading everybody. Uh, <laughs> but but WSGI is uh, probably the uh, least well known, most important Python standard interface that that's floating around. WSGI is the web server gateway interface, the Python web server gateway interface, and its basic purpose is to have a, a standardized framework for a web server to talk to a Python web application. So the context for this was uh, was originally standardized, uh, proposed in 2003 uh, by PJ Eby, and this was in an environment where we had lots of uh, lots of different web frameworks like Turbo Gears that Andrew was talking about uh, that could all uh, that all basically had ad hoc methods of being called by web servers. Like some of them would include web servers themselves, like Twisted, which had Twisted.web, Twisted's web servers internal. Uh, some of them had kind of ad hoc frameworks for, a, say, to Apache to call into them using something like Mod Python. Uh, and what that meant was your choice of web server was often quite heavily dictated by your choice of web application framework. So if you wanted to write Turbo Gears, then you couldn't necessarily just pick up any HTTP server you wanted. You probably had a limited range of options. The goal of WSGI was to take uh, a bit the idea of, of CGI, the common gateway interface, and to apply it specifically to Python. So to say, all right, well, if you're writing a Python web application, uh, here is how servers promise to call you uh, to, to get you to render the data back. And uh, on the other side, saying to servers, uh, if you promise to call web applications like this, then all web applications will work with you just as well as they'll work with anything else. And that was a pretty good idea. Got spec'd as uh, PEP 333, which is a pretty easy number to remember. And because it was very, very simple and very, very powerful, it became enormously successful. So WSGI is, is a big enough deal that for people in the know, it gets mentioned on uh, things like the Accidental Tech Podcast from time to time. It inspired a whole lot of other languages to copy it. So Perl's got a version. It's got PSGI, the Perl server gateway interface. Uh, Rack for Ruby he is heavily inspired by WSGI, and like uh, it mentions WSGI on its uh, documentation, for example. So uh, WSGI was arguably a barnstorming success uh, and has been very, very reliable and uh, useful. So it's still sitting here 13 years after being originally specified uh, and and going just fine. And I'd just like to step in and just say, like, give people a quick outline of what Whiskey looks like as a spec. Because, like, you mentioned it was very simple, but, like, it is astonishingly simple. Like, Whiskey just says an application should be a callable that takes two arguments and returns a generator or a string. Like, it's an incredibly simple interface that is almost beautiful in, in how it's managed to stay with the times, right? Like, you know, this is a 13 year old thing, yet the basic idea of a callable object being the 
entire way that you interact with something has, has stayed very true. And I, you know, personally, I find that very nice about whiskey. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, whiskey is, it sits in a, in a very interesting place in, in the Python ecosystem as, as something that is kind of, you've heard that you presumably heard this saying about uh, programming languages, which is that there's only two kinds of programming languages, which is ones people hate and one no, ones no one uses. Yes. <laughs> like whiskey is in exactly that space. Like lots of people don't have very many nice things to say about whiskey, but they have these not nice things to say about whiskey because they use it and have used it for a long time and are, are kind of comfortable with the warts that it has. And uh, it's it's really really important to remember that whiskey is uh, astonishingly good at what it does. And if you compare, like you know, one of its contemporaries, like um, DBAPI two, which is the Python standard for database drivers, like it's a massively more complex API, um, and like there's some much more variation in how it's implemented. So like comparing it to other things, even inside Python, like it's, I think, done very well at being this sort of nice, simple thing. Yeah, agreed. As you mentioned, it's been around for a long time and has managed to adapt pretty well to changes in programming and in our uses of HTTP over that same time frame. So since this is a conversation about your proposal for a new revision of the WSGI specification, can you elucidate some of why that is necessary, given the flexibility that it has shown up to this point? I mean, yeah, I, I think so. I, I think one thing that's really important to, to clarify here as well is um, one of the questions that's on the table, one of the things that we are discussing is not just, you know, how, how should we revise whiskey, but do we need to revise whiskey? Like, uh, one of the kind of core questions uh, that I really did want to get away is like, is do we do we want to actually say that for what whiskey does right now is that perfect? Like, do we want to not uh, revise or you know update whiskey, but instead um, extend whiskey, leave what ha what it do is right now exactly as it is, uh, and uh, add new features either in parallel specifications or as whiskey extensions, optional whiskey extensions. But there are there have been some. There has been some strain put on whiskey, I think, is the way to, to think about it uh, as, as time's moved on. And it's not necessarily capable of expressing everything a modern web application developer might want to express. Yeah, I mean, it's 13 years old. You know, like, the web has changed in the intervening decade and a bit. And it's changed a great deal. In yeah, I think it's not surprising that, you know, you know, my astonishment that it's done so well is, is that. Like, it's, it's from a place where, you know, images were an optional thing. And, that, and that's come all the way through to a place where the web looks very, very different. So I think that's one of the sort of things that led into this discussion of like, you know, A, do we need to change it? And B, how should we if we need to? Yeah. So for some timelining stuff here, um, uh, HTTP 1.1, RF, so standardized in RFC 2616, was standardized in 1999. WSGI was standardized in 2003, four years later. Uh, HTTP was then, uh, that, so RFC 2616 was updated in 2013 uh, to, to, to basically bring it into line with what was actually happening. The web had evolved so much beyond it that the IETF felt there was a need to rewrite those specs. And then also HTTP was updated again much more recently uh, with HTTP 2. And WSGI has been left entirely unchanged. So WSGI looks exactly as it did uh, back when we first uh, spec'd it modulo one small change in 2010. Yeah, I mean, you know, talking about the web has changed a lot in 13 years, I, I would say it has changed by orders of magnitude. You have only to go to the Wayback Machine and pick any site from 13 years ago. And like you said, you'll you'll see it is it is a dramatically different experience. Yeah, absolutely. Web pages are much, much larger than they were. They're much more complicated than they were. Uh, there's all this stuff now for the real time web and trying to develop things that are as fast as possible and as up to date as possible and as interactive as possible. And there is a legitimate question about whether or not WSGI fits really well into that kind of paradigm. And not to mention that HTTP has kind of become the de facto language or not language, de facto protocol for talking between different things. Like it's not just websites now. You've got all the different, you know, um, like machines and utilities and consumer devices all talking HTTP to backend servers. Like it's almost this common way of just having apps and devices talk to backends now. So dovetailing into that discussion, what are some of the ways the current WSGI spec has fallen out of step with the needs of modern developers? So 
I think the I mean, the primary answer for me here, at least, and kind of the reason I'm here is, is WebSockets. So WebSockets are perhaps the most significant change to the flow of the web that's happened in, in those intervening 13 years. Um, even HTTP2 is still mostly request response. You know, you send a request, you get a response. Whereas WebSockets is just like, it's a socket in some sense. You open a socket and things can just flow either way. And that really doesn't mesh terribly well with WSGI's callable nature. You know, this idea that you can send multiple things, but things can be received during that time. And there's no necessary sort of ordering or structure to that. And to me, that's the the major way it's fallen out of step. There, there are obviously other things as well. Um, I think, Corey, you probably know some of those better than I do. Uh, so I can certainly leap in. Um, and, and I'll just follow on directly from Andrew for a second, which is that uh, one of the reasons it's quite good to have both me and Andrew here is that uh, where Andrew cares a great deal about WebSockets, I care a great deal about HTTP2. Mm. Um, and Andrew's right that the basic model of HTTP2 does fit into Whiskey. So the request response totally still works. But HTTP2 is a massively more featureful protocol than HTTP1 was. There is much more uh, you can do and a much more um, uh, there's much more control you can have over the way the requests and responses flow and the way the connection looks. And WSGI doesn't expose any of that option. So essentially, uh, from a Python developer's perspective, the only thing HTTP2 does is make your uh, server moderately more efficient. But it doesn't give you any more uh, hooks if you're behind WSGI. The other big, big concern uh, that a lot of people have had with WSGI is the way that WSGI limits some of what you can do in Python. So... Uh, Andrew mentioned that WSGI is defined as a Python calling convention. So you call a callable, you get passed some Python objects, and you return a generator or a, 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 a string. The problem with this is that this means that, uh, in most cases, the server and the Python application are running in process together. And this limits some of what you can do with the concurrency model. So, for example, if you wanted to write yourself a nice modern Python 3.5 application using async I.O., so you've got a nice asynchronous you know, bit of logic and you don't wait on the database and all this other stuff, uh, the server really kind of needs to play ball with that. The server needs to go, all right, that's totally fine. Uh, we're going to uh, we're gonna do this appropriately. And it's quite tricky for a server to do that. And as far as I'm aware, no server does. Uh, there's some question marks. You can maybe do G-Unicorn with G-Event and some other fun stuff, but... Generally speaking, particularly async I.O. Uh, is not well supported by, by web servers at all. And this means that, generally speaking, if you wanted to write asynchronous web applications, if you wanted to write something that uses async I.O. or Twisted or Tornado, you kind of have to throw away Whiskey uh, because it doesn't really work. And that means you also kind of have to throw away your web frameworks. So asynchronous web applications for Python basically have lost the big gain that Whiskey gave, which was that you didn't have to care what your server was. You do have to care what your server is. Your server's probably going to be uh, twisted.web if you use twisted, tornado is built in web server if you use tornado, or AIO HTTP if you use async IO. This and, is not like a, sorry, go uh, on. I say, um, we're already seeing quite a lot of this as well, like with, with Django. So like, obviously um, the biggest pressure here is, is something like WebSockets where you can handle WebSockets in Whiskey thread. You can just get the raw socket object and upgrade it. But because there's no concurrency, that lends you to one socket per process or thread, which is an incredibly inefficient way of serving this stuff when most of their time is spent open in an idle state. And so we see more and more people adding things like, as you said, tornado front ends or twisted or even things like um, Go or something like that. And like a, a, se a separate language that is more capable of handling these asynchronous kind of communications in front of a more traditional WSGI server or website stack. And I think that's, you know, not a great split to have if you're trying to keep one code base. Yeah, it goes a beautiful example of this, actually, because this is, you know, you'll see people at PyCon stand up and say, well, how do we fight the, the hemorrhaging of people to go? And this is one of the things that causes people to leave to go, is that they can uh, use the built-in, the, the Go web frameworks that are being developed, and they're pretty young compared to something like Django, but they do exist. They can use them with WebSockets, with HTTP2, uh, built-in standard, uh, and it's all, all joyous. Now, there's some efforts to like fight this problem. So, um, for example, Twisted is the example I know best because I know Twisted best. Um, there is a version, of, there's a Django-alike, I think is the best way to call it, that exists, for, that runs on Twisted. It's called Hendrix, and there's a Flask-alike that exists on Twisted. It's called Klein. They've all got, you know, clever, punny names. Um, but the, the core problem is they're not Django, they're not Flask, and you can't program like they are. 
you can't take your Django application and start chucking in you know, web sockets and twisted deferreds and expect that to work. Uh, and of course, the other problem, uh, the problem then is there's no WSGI equivalent for web sockets. There's no WSGI equivalent for HTTP2's special function. So a server, even if it wanted to, has to define its own uh, essentially proprietary extension, uh, which things like uWSGI have done. Uh, the uWSGI web server has done this for web sockets, I think. But its extension is proprietary and it's built to work best with uWSGI, which means that it may not port so well into something like uh, ModWSGI, which has got some exciting calling conventions, uh, or into uh, Nginx with its mod whiskey, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those, those are, are real problems. And I just wanted to sort of jump in real quick here and say, also, you know, talking about the other things like Klein and uh, Hendrix and the like, I'm sure from a developer perspective, if you're going to have to port your entire code base to a different paradigm anyway, there must be some temptation there to say, okay, well, maybe we need to take a step back and say, is Python the right platform for us to be doing this job in? And like you said, at that point, things like Go or, or Scala or any number of other languages be, you know, can start to look a little more attractive because their sort of mainstream has excellent you know, concurrency support sort of baked into the, you know, to their DNA. Yeah, think- that's absolutely true. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. Like one of the things we see is, you know, Django as a framework sees is this sort of like, you know, we're not limited by Python necessarily, but there are people always want more things. And some of those things are fundamental features of Python. And certainly even at Eventbrite, we've taken a couple of projects and tried them in Go, you know, things that were just very heavily asynchronous. And you know, we're, we're still on Python 2.7 there as well, which is a different matter entirely. And I think... There, there are there are some nice things at other languages, um, but also there's a lot less sort of library support and maturity in the frameworks at this point. So I think it's not so much a problem as stemming the flow as just like, you know, improving the experience of people who are already here, right? We, we can make people's lives a lot easier, stop having so much fragmentation of different kinds of components in different languages and hopefully have a bit more sanity but people there's still a good reason to use other languages i'm not saying there's not but i'd like to see people choose them purely on merit rather than being pushed away yeah so i i'm i'm definitely in agreement with andrew there and so again like i have written and will continue to write some web services in go because sometimes writing in go is just going to be the fastest way to solve the problem but but i think i want to draw attention to, to something that was said earlier which was that um that go has this kind of concurrency baked into the language and i think one thing that's that that i see a lot that i think is a little bit unfair is uh uh, is that people will often be talk about how uh, go's got these fantastic concurrency uh patterns and it's got a http server built in and uh, and all this stuff and i've there's always been a little part of me that wants to go well twisted has these things like (laughs) we do have this in python but of course one of the problems and one of the reasons that something like whiskey is really important is that for a lot of Python programmers, Twisted does not feel like Python. Uh, its coding style is different, and it, it calls things all different names than they're used to things being called. And and that's a real problem. I'm not trying to minimize that problem. I think it's real. And that's part of what WSGI helps is, well, actually, with the existence of WSGI, you can run Twisted as a web server. If you want a pure Python stack, you could run Twisted as a web server and run your Python. And t- Twisted will call into it, and it will all be Python, and it will all be Twisted-y. Uh, but... Uh, Generally speaking, that's not very popular. I get the sense that Twisted has kind of a a reputation for being kind of a steep learning curve, which is unfortunate because obviously it's really great at what it does and there are a lot of people using it to great effect in production. And even in my company, there's a ton of Twisted in production. So it would be an interesting social engineering experiment to see if we could tackle that and get people to feel more comfortable working with it. Yeah, yeah. I, with with Twisted, I've got a. I don't want to. I don't want to turn this into a how great is Twisted podcast. But um, I, I have a personal belief, which is based on my experience with Twisted, which is that I reckon most Python programmers have, cover this kind of trajectory where they first come into Python and everything's wonderful, and then they start wanting asynchronous stuff, and someone says, "Oh, you should look at Twisted," and they look at Twisted, and it's all terrifying uh, because nothing is the same, and all the there's camel case all over the place where they're not expecting it, and they can't find any documentation, or the documentation's out of date and they see the, all this terrifying other stuff and their libraries don't work and they go away from it and they come up with this idea that Twisted's terrible or it's, you know, too old or any of these problems. And, and I reckon that 
once you get past a certain point of having used Python long enough, you, you kind of find your way back to Twisted eventually, and you look at it through fresh eyes, through the eyes of an experienced programmer who's comfortable with different coding styles uh, and different terminology, and you suddenly go, oh, hang on, this is this project that's 14 years old, older than Whiskey. I should clarify here. Twisted is older than Whiskey and has survived uh, all kinds of different trends and is still here to talk about it uh, and perhaps has some ideas that are worth paying attention to. Yeah, I think this plays into sort of the larger story of the stuff. Is that like I think Twisted, Twisted is the end of the path of socket programming, right? It's this, like, if you want to do all the horrible things, like, you know, I used to write, um, like, mi Minecraft binary servers in Twisted. Like, it, it has all <laughs> the things for that stuff, right? But <laughs> it's the end of that path. And if you go there straight after you go into Python, you, you haven't gone down the path enough to really appreciate it. And it's kind of the truth with, with, like, Django as well. Like, one of the things I think I think makes Django so good is this sort of gradual revealing of what's behind each layer of curtains like you you go in up front you do some simple views and then we pull the curtain back and there's more behind it i think whiskey's kind of nice like that too like you know whiskey is this up front apparently simple thing and then you pull the curtain back and you can see exactly how it's implemented and like and then you start you sort of learn its intricacies and its problems but i think that ideal of this sort of initially simple and there's levels of understanding is, is a good thing to aim for in any kind of spec so bringing this back to to the topic a little bit, how did you guys come to be involved with a new WSGI specification? What brought you into the process? Let's start with uh, Corey this time. Uh, okay, uh, I, I guess the, the simplest thing is I, I brought myself into it. I reintroduced this idea in the, the start of January. And uh, I say reintroduced because uh, reintroduced is absolutely the word. This is not the first time we have, uh, the Python community has looked at Whiskey and said, okay, well, what can we do uh, to bring this forward? But I got here because I've been working on HTTP2. So I worked, I've been working on HTTP2 for two years now, uh, part of the IETF. And this included writing some Python implementations. So I wrote a Python client implementation, and then I wrote a much better general Python implementation of HTTP2. Um, and this led me to start talking to Robert Collins. So Robert Collins also works at HP, um, and he does a lot of different things. He works in the same team as me, he works upstream. But he was interested in WSGI specifically and the future of WSGI and how that would fit in with HTTP2 and WebSockets. So we started talking, and I agreed to collaborate with him on, on some of this in the WebSIG, uh, the Web Special Interest Group, in 2015. And, and we got some way forward. So uh, Rob corralled some people and we started talking about it and he proposed kind of an initial uh, thin draft of a PEP, but he had uh, some personal commitments, which meant that he no longer had time to pursue this. In that intervening time, I got hired at HP uh, to work on open source software full time. Uh, and this means that I now have the time to, uh, to lead this conversation, where by lead, I mostly mean uh, corral and um, keep everyone try and keep people on topic and try and kind of get consensus, which is actually quite a lot of work. Uh, and I agreed that I would restart that this year. So this year I uh, started this year, I sent out an email that basically said, all right, we're going to try this again and uh, try to kind of shape uh, the way that conversation was going to go. Yeah, my, my path in was a little bit different. So the story behind uh, my side is that basically I've been wanting to put native WebSocket support into Django for quite a long time now, a couple of years. And this year, um, Mozilla opened up their um, Mozilla Open Source Support Program, which is a program to fund sort of well-known open source projects to, to implement new features. And so we applied for a grant for them um, for a thing called Django Channels, which is our initiative to basically bring WebSockets and background tasks and other things into Django itself. And we got that grant, and so I started work on that. And part of that work is a very separate specification inside Django um, which is currently codenamed in a slightly optimistic way, ASGI. Um, but that is a much more high-level spec around how different processes or threads communicate basically about HTTP or background tasks or WebSockets or things like that. So it's sort of this higher-level encapsulation of stuff um, designed for use inside Django so that people are writing third-party Django backends, for example, can understand how to write one of those. Um, and as part of that, it's, you know, it, it sort of touches in some things of where Whiskey is as well. You know, it, it defines a way of encoding and responding to HTTP requests, among other things. Um, but it's also meant to sit on top of Whiskey. And so 
I was working on this and sort of making implementations and that kind of stuff. Um, and then the uh, Whiskey 2 compilation started up again in earnest. And I woke up to about five or six different Twitter mentions and three emails in my inbox and was then hurriedly dragged into the conversation about Whiskey 2. You know, as, you know, both at representative Django in our general interest in web stuff, as well as somebody who wants to see this WebSocket stuff go ahead as well. Yeah, and, and I should be clear here that the fact that Andrew ended up in this is not an accident. And there had been plans to involve uh, Andrew in his specific role as someone working on channels uh, in this discussion. Yes. But there was also a very concerted effort to get people from uh, communities that already use whiskey. Because uh, the worst possible thing we could have done is talk about how to develop a new whiskey specification without involving anyone who actually uses it on a day-to-day -day basis. And that would have been very, very bad. Uh, so uh, there was a big outreach effort to try and you know, ping people who, who were skilled or relevant in this conversation to try and get them involved. Do you think that the WSGI name itself brings a lot of expectation, or do you think it'll be good to keep it as a well-recognized Python landmark? Uh, the WSGI name brings a load of expectation. Um, WSGI, like, as both Andrew and I have said uh, very positively, WSGI is, is a very, very good thing, and it's extremely successful. I can't think of many Python uh, either projects or uh, specifications that are as successful as WSGI is. And... From where I'm sitting, it seems like in the wake of the kind of initial call for comments, the consensus seems to be that uh, Whiskey is a good name and should remain the name of the thing we already call Whiskey. Uh, so any new work should try to avoid co-opting the name of Whiskey uh, because it, it should uh, exist on its own as a, a completed piece of work judged in its own right without being contaminated by the later work that we do. Yeah, I think, you know, Whiskey, one of the biggest expectations is really like the issue of backwards compatibility and things like that. And Whiskey has grown a few annoying problems over the years. Um, one of the main ones being that it, the way it encodes data is different on Python 2 and Python 3 for historical reasons. I think, you know, sort of taking all that stuff and wrapping up and Making something that still presents as whiskey and having people accept that is a very difficult prospect. Um, and in many ways, I think that having it be called something else would be an easy way of, around that. You know, one of the reasons my attempt at this inside Django was nowhere near related to whiskey is that I just know trying to go near that territory is going to, I think, end in problems where, like, you can't promise somebody a new whiskey and then have it not look exactly like it, I don't think. And do you think it would be better to make a clean break and implement an entirely new set of APIs and style of interaction, or is the intent to try and maintain some backwards compatibility to provide an easier upgrade path for the existing web frameworks? That's a tough one. I think, well, I mean, there's no, there's no consensus yet, right? I think we all have our own opinions. Um, if you read through the, the list where this is all being discussed, everyone has, like, some people want extensions to existing one that can be declared. Some people want a whole new thing. Some people want to basically have it entirely divorced and not have it like the whiskey at all. And so, you know, I can, I can speak to my personal opinion. And my personal opinion, I think, is a fresh start is needed, which is what I'm working on. But I'm not sure if that is even a feasible way of doing things in terms of the magnitude of work. So, you know, I'm, st I'm still personally unsure at this point more what needs to be done. Yeah, I can definitely imagine that if you were to do a complete clean break that we would potentially end up in a similar situation of the Python 2 and 3 schism where you have a huge body of web frameworks that are already tied to the WSGI specification and there's a very non-zero amount of work necessary to be able to bring them to the point of being able to implement the new specification and then there would also be a need potentially for maintaining compatibility with both specifications simultaneously, depending on the use cases of the people who are implementing their applications, and also depending on how the new specification plays out in terms of how it interacts with the HTTP 1.1 specification. Yeah, I, I think like any, if there was ever a, a brand new spec, it would have to have interoperability both directions, that's client and server with WSGI. I think that's that's basically the only way to stop any fragmentation. And it's the thing, you know, that I think everyone agrees in retrospect Python 3 should have done is a more gentle upgrade path. I think um, any, if there is a wholesale replacement, should have, you know, 
a way to plug in whiskey clients and servers into it, just at least in the interim. So I think, you know, it, it, whatever we end up with will be a superset. It won't be more restrictive than what we have now. Yeah, I think Andrew's, uh, Andrew's got that there. And it seems to be a consensus of the working group as well, is that uh, it might be best rather than creating a new version of whiskey that you have to opt into that includes all this other stuff, is to keep whiskey as it is, as a, a functional already existing thing, and to supplement it with... Uh, with new functionality and new APIs uh, rather than try to, to kind of create this brand new thing out of whole cloth and hope people, uh, people take it. How has the response been to your call for comments and what are some of the most frequently raised concerns or suggestions? The response has been great. <laughs> the response has actually been outstanding. I, I was delighted with how well this went. We received feedback uh, on the list already from, uh, I would say, something nearing 10 people, and I, I received some off-list feedback as well from uh, five or 10 others. And that included quite a lot, wide range of opinions. So I think one of the, the most interesting things was that the, uh, the mailing list contained a very small cluster of commonly requested things, and then a very, very long tail of, uh, of other ideas that people were interested in. So from, from where I was sitting, the things that I, that the most frequent concerns were really about this one of scope of like, do we want to co-opt the name of Whiskey? Do we want to uh, extend Whiskey? Does Whiskey need extending? Uh, to what extent uh, should we uh, try and build a brand new thing versus trying to build new things that supplement Whiskey instead of uh, co-opting it? Uh, although the other thing that, uh, that was very common was what Andrew mentioned about uh, Whiskey behaving differently on Python 3, and in particular, it's slightly perplexing choice that it encodes uh, HTTP headers as Unicode strings using Latin one. Mm -hmm. There was a remarkable amount of negative feedback about that design choice. Yeah. Understandably so, I imagine. Yeah, well, I mean, I I found that mildly surprising because actually from where I was sat, that seemed like maybe the best of a bad set of options. But uh, it certainly seems like the consensus now is that while that might have been true at the time, it's definitely not true now. What are some of the proposed changes to the specification or supplements to the existing specification? Again, I'd say there were quite a few. Uh, some of them were proposals that had hung over from previous uh, discussions and some were new, but the, the proposals really ran the gamut. So there were lots of big proposals like, let's change the calling convention to one that's built on top of async IO and coroutines. Uh, so wholesale change to Whiskey. You know, there were some smaller ones. Let's add uh, supports for WebSockets into Whiskey so that a Whiskey HTTP request can go into Whiskey and get upgraded and automatically turn into WebSockets using some magic API source that we hadn't decided on yet. Or make it possible to extract the socket object that the server has from Whiskey. So if the application decides that it doesn't want the server involved anymore, it can just grab the socket and say, all right, I own the protocol now. Just be a dumb data pipe for me, please. Or completely, one of the other ones was uh, completely rewriting Whiskey. So say, all right, well, let's adopt something more like uh, ASGI, for example, and and abandon Whiskey as the kind of legacy approach. And then there were some smaller ones, like much more tightly scoped. Here are some specific concrete problems with Whiskey that we should address. Some problems around uh, the Whiskey file wrapper, which is something that I suspect not many people use, uh, in part because it's got some ambiguity in it and some nasty little edge cases uh, and uh, header handling again uh, which came up as something that was not enormously popular and people would like addressed. So are there any future directions that you think WSGI should take that perhaps haven't been considered yet? I want to hear from Andrew on this because I think we covered everything. Yeah I, I think we, we've definitely had pretty much every possible suggestion on the sun so far. Um, I think I'm certainly playing for the more extreme end of the of the range here, which is basically subsume it with a brand new spec. Um, but again, like my interest is much more like internal to Django. Like whatever ASGI ends up being, it will be possible to plug it into WSGI or whatever its successor is ends up being. So it's much more like a internal Django way of saying this is how Django encodes requests. You know, similar to the way we have a Django request class. I do think we've covered pretty much every possibility. You know, like the range of voices on this topic has been very wide. And one of the issues is that, right? Like some people want just incremental fixes to like how chunked encoding works. Other people want to basically throw the whole thing under the bus and start from scratch. Um, there's probably a happy middle ground in the middle of that. But yeah, there, there are a lot of options here. And I can't think of anything more 
crazy than one of the ideas has been brought up yet. Yeah. <laughs> and that's going to be one of the fun things about this whole process is the desire is to ensure that everybody gets something that's close to what they want. And that means that whatever we build needs to work with, with Django's channels because Django's important and we don't want Django to, uh, to walk away from the Python community and design its own things and start co-opting Twisted, for example. Um, and we want to make sure that the people who want WSGI to just be a slightly better version of what it is, they get what they want. Uh, and that the people who think they need WebSockets directly, they get that what they want. Uh, and there, there probably is a design goal that will work for this. And I think we're kind of beginning to come towards consensus on what that would look like. But that's the, the thing that's really exciting is trying to make sure we can build something that fits all of those criteria. And has your opinion or vision of the proposed update changed as you reviewed responses to the conversation on the mailing list? I think mine definitely has. Like, you know, I, I, I came into this with a very greenfield approach and I, I always knew, you know, internally that there is no way one could simply go from scratch. And I think that's, and like a lot of the responses about places Wizzy falls down, I think prove like the difficulty in getting something this mature, right? Like, so I think my, my, my view has changed much more towards more iteration and building on the past because there's a lot of learning in those years of whiskey and there's a lot of code built around it. And I think, I mean, I, I'm experienced enough developer at this point to know that trying to build something from scratch is always a bad idea. Um, but particularly in this case where HTTP still has its little tricky issues um, that you've got to work around and how like all but one header can be combined, but one header can't be combined. <laughs> yeah. So it's particularly <laughs> nasty. Yeah, I'm with Andrew on this one. Uh, I definitely open uh, you know i began it my original email you can go and look at it had all these grand you know oh let what could we do think about uh all the kind of wacky things we could do all kind of architecture astronaut craziness um and i got brought back to earth very very quickly uh by by people who very very effectively argued that whiskey as it stands is a valuable thing and can be improved without being abandoned and that's that's a, a path really worth considering. And and that argument more or less entirely won me over. Um, so I I'm now kind of prepared to go with the argument that says let's try and keep as many of the the lessons that were learned in WSGI as possible, uh, and and build new things that don't ruin what we already have. And that's the advantage of having to consult with a lot of uh, a lot of experts in the field. There are people involved in this mailing list discussion who've been working with WSGI for 12 years. Uh, and 12 years ago I was 13. So I think their feedback is, is fairly important. And do you have any ideas of how to design the new specification in order to avoid a similar situation of needing to deprecate the current standards in order to accommodate new web protocols? So I think that's basically impossible. Like if you make, like making something ultimately flexible makes it ultimately complicated, right? That's, that's, the, that's the problem. That's the trade-off you have there. And I think, you know, we could have this wonderful extensible thing where like oh you can just have anything and it goes anywhere um but then you lose a lot of the, the nice conciseness and simplicity of whiskey so i think there's a, there's a middle ground there as well um where like you know we know the current protocols that the web needs which is ht1 http 2 web sockets possibly web rtc um there's a couple of things like that as well that's sort of more in the development mental stages that aren't quite there yet i don't think we should try and anticipate what people are going to try out can't be 13 years from now because i think the web will be very different like again you know like imagine what's happened in the last 13 years and then add that to the web now like will they even recognize what's going on then you know will, will they synchronous even be a thing or will we will we have changed programming paradigm who knows yeah unsurprisingly i agree with andrew um uh, and i think it's worth clarifying here a couple things like one of them is I, I suspect now as a working group, we're not likely to deprecate whiskey. I think we're likely to say that whiskey uh, works just fine. Uh, and the, the way to think about whiskey is not as something that is deprecated, but as kind of, um, uh, I guess I would call it an evolutionary dead end. Like it works really well on what it works on now, but it won't necessarily evolve to kind of cope with or encompass new protocols. Uh, and that actually, that limitation is a good approach for interface design. Like Andrew said, generality, uh, absolute generality is a problem. And so it often helps to say, well, okay, we, we know the limit of this thing. Let's build to that. And then when we need to replace it, we replace it. There, there's nothing wrong with replacing things. There's nothing wrong with saying, okay, this thing was good enough, but it's not good enough anymore. And we need a new thing. 
protocols are only as useful for as long as they're useful. And once they're not useful, we need to not get too sentimental about replacing them. And, and that's progress, and we, we shouldn't necessarily mourn it. But that doesn't mean we should take a flamethrower to what's already there. Same as HTTP 1.1 is still perfectly good, and it's not going away anytime soon just because HTTP 2 exists. It, it's good at what it's good at. And for most cases, for a lot of cases, that doesn't need to be changed. What we have an opportunity to do here is to pave the way for this kind of discussion again. So this is what HTTP2 did. Like HTTP2 was very painful to specify, but having done it, everyone feels a lot better about their ability to specify hypothetically in HTTP3. We kind of know how to do this now. We know what the, the rules are and what the difficulties are. And that's the opportunity we've got here, which is that we can pave the way for having to do this again. So we can go, okay, here's how you kind of come up with this new uh, WSGI equivalent for your protocol of choice. Uh, and that's the thing we, one of the things we really need to be looking at is making sure that these lessons can get, uh, can get learned and, and understood for the next time we have to do this. That's really interesting. So I'm sorry. So, so basically you're sort of putting effort and, and development manpower into the process and making the process efficient. Like we know things are going to change. Let's let, let's get really good at designing new specifications that adapt to the new conditions in the field as opposed to putting so much effort into creating this all singing, all dancing, super generalized thing, and you end up with something like what, and I hate to say this, the Java community did where you have six, you know, hundred lines of XML configuration for Hello World or something like that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think one of the lessons that are, is slowly being learned uh, by, by the wider program community is that it is okay to have specialized tools that only do one thing or, and, and do it as best as they can. And it's tempting to kind of look at that and go, well, that's the Unix philosophy, but that's not really right. Uh, I, I mean it much more at the level of like, it is okay to have a, an application stack that involves eight different programming languages. So long as they can all communicate with each other and work together, then it's not a problem to use the best tool for the job. And that lesson should be learned uh, in terms of interfaces and protocols like this. It, it is okay to have something that is tightly scoped and works really, really well at the one thing it needs to do. So what are some of the points of contention or rigorous debate that have kept previous WSGI 2 attempts from succeeding? Well, there's been a lot, <laughs> but, but it mostly comes out of how widely deployed WSGI is. Um, and despite all of its warts and, and difficulties, like we said, it's been really, really successful and really, really widely deployed. And that means a lot of people have got a lot riding on, on Whiskey in its current form and the future of Whiskey. Um, there are lots of people who have either their job relies on Whiskey in some form or their reputation relies on Whiskey. Um, uh, I don't want to call anyone specifically here, but there are a lot of people who the vast, vast majority of what they've done and a lot of their um, their most notable work has been in the WSGI arena, and they have done excellent work. And they understandably are defensive about wanting that to, to remain valuable. And I think that they're, they're right. Their work is good. I don't want to throw any of that stuff away. Uh, and generally speaking, these haven't led to deadlock. Like, this hasn't been a lot of people going, nothing must change. Everyone wants change. They just don't all agree on what they want. And so we get bogged down in the weeds. Everyone wants their one specific thing and fights their corner. And you, we've needed uh, someone with time and motivation to kind of push for consensus. Uh, and no one has it. No one has, has, has got that amount of time, really, because you really need to just be paid to do it. You need to have enough money to sit down and spend it as your day job and kind of corral people together. We haven't had that as an opportunity. I think HP is providing that opportunity for me now. And for as long as they're prepared to keep paying me, I'm, I'm prepared to try and uh, try and get some consensus going here. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Corey on this one. I think like a lot of it is that there's so many different interests, both on the server side and on the application side, that it's almost impossible. Like whichever way you want to poke out of the specification in a new direction, somebody's already locked down that part, right? Like, everyone has their own part that they're coded around that they think is important. So it's very difficult to find a place to extend or change without stepping on somebody's toes. But I think there is, a, as Corey says, a way of finding consensus there with, with effort and time and reconciliation and working out who's doing what. And perhaps, you know, people helping other people. Like, you know, Django as a project is more than happy to help other projects if what we want steps other projects' toes. Like, you know, we have the funding to help do some stuff like this. 
So are there any questions that we didn't ask that you think we should have or anything else that you'd like to bring up? I think it's a good idea to, to ask just, uh, just quickly whether or not, you know, some, as, as, the, as someone who's responsible for trying to push this through, whether or not I think I can, we can satisfy everyone with this work. Like, do, do we necessarily feel like there is a one correct, one correct answer that everyone will be happy with? Because that's the, the question that, that I feel like everyone defining a protocol or a specification or anything that someone wants to interrupt with has to ask themselves at a certain point is, is this work worthwhile? And I guess I'll just lead into answering my own question, because why not? Where, where I feel like uh, the answer to that is no. So uh, I don't think, I think whatever this working group produces, whether that is nothing, whether that is a small revision to WSGI and nothing else, whether that is uh, a brand new thing like uh, ASGI, whether that is small extensions to WSGI, I can guarantee to you that 10 years from now, there will be a lot of angry blog posts about how terrible our work was. Um, and a lot of people getting a lot of uh, Twitter equivalent likes, whatever Twitter is 10 years from now, um, for, for kind of tearing that work down. Uh, and the reality with this is that when you're specifying something that needs to work broadly and generally, uh, you can't satisfy everyone, and frequently you can't satisfy anyone. Uh, there are too many people, they want too many different things. And as far as I can tell, that's not a reason not to do it. Uh, that's a reason to be aware of, uh, of the limitations of what you can do. Whiskey has been super successful, super valuable, uh, and having something like Whiskey for new protocols is a really clearly good idea. But beyond that, everything is just, uh, it's just about how well you can do what you can do and, and whether or not you can build something that's useful. Uh, and that's the goal is to, build something that people use enough to hate it. That's success for me. Uh, anything better than that is just gravy. Yeah, I, I, it's one of those things with like you know, classic diplomacy negotiation is that a good negotiation is one where everyone walks away slightly unhappy. Like that's finally you've done it well. That's a good compromise. So I think what we end up with will be good and functional. It won't be this pristine piece of design that everyone's proud of, but I think it will serve a good purpose. And that's really what I want to see out of this particular process. So one last thing that I just thought of, is there anything that you feel that our listeners could do to help sort of get this process moving in a positive direction and, and ideally concluded? Because I feel like as a community, the fact that we haven't agreed on something like this is kind of hurting us, right? Like, and it would be good to make it happen. What can we all do to help essentially? From where I'm sat, there are, are two really good things. The first one is to be involved in the discussion. So this discussion's not happened in private. We're not a little cabal that meets in a room in some massive mansion and talks about <laughs> how we're taking over the world. Where uh, where the Python uh, Web Special Interest Group is the Web SIG. So if you Google Python Web Dash SIG, you can find the mailing list, uh, and you should join the mailing list and. At the very least, you can read and think about how we're all stupid, and maybe you can also write some emails and tell us that we're stupid, because that feedback is important uh, if delivered appropriately. Uh, and if you don't say anything, then it is hard for us to take account of your opinions uh, and views, and they're valid and important, and, and that's, that is really necessary. But the other really, really useful thing you can do is you can use the things that are being proposed and talked about here and provide feedback. Our work is only as good as the feedback we get. So, for example, um, Django Channels that Andrew's been talking about, it exists right now. You can play with it. It's uh, My understanding, Andrew, is it's relatively early. Uh, yeah. But it does um, exist. You can download it and play it. You can tell Andrew, oh, here's the things that work really well. Here's the things that have rough edges. Uh, and that feedback is extremely important uh, to try and... Uh, get a feeling for, for what works because it's really easy if you're just working kind of by yourself in a room to to lose track of what the wider community needs and is doing yeah i find it very important to not develop a spec in a vacuum like the idea of developing specification without any actual code or examples underlying it i find very difficult to do and so for that reason you know django channels and the ASCII spec and things that talk like spec already exist and you know those help inform how i change it and how people feedback about it so i think as Corey says like not only stuff I'm doing, but any other stuff that comes out of this, like use it, feedback, what you like, what you don't like, 
like that's ultimately making developers' lives easier is what we're trying to do here. So that kind of feedback is very important. Yeah, absolutely. And and in particular, I should mention that we're, we're not we're not. I, I suspect we're not just working on one thing here. We're going to want to make small improvements to Whiskey, and people need to work with those and play with those. We're going to want to make new things, probably either small things that work with WebSockets or big things like ASGI and maybe both. One thing we might end up deciding to do is to say, look, ASGI is a good architecture and deserves to be more general. Let's drag it through the WebSig and polish it into a PEP and turn that into a Python thing. And the better the work is on ASGI, the better that uh, the better that opportunity is. So uh, the, the most, most valuable thing that people can do if they want to help here is to try these new things and, and see how they work and come up with a, an informed opinion about how these things can be done better. Because there's nothing worse, that the only thing worse rather than designing a spec in a vacuum, like Andrew talked about, is designing a spec in uh, what appears to be a vacuum but is actually a Twitter hate chamber. Uh, it is much more useful to, rather than taking the feedback to Twitter, to take it to the mailing list so we can take some kind of action on it. Well, we really appreciate the both of you taking some time out of your weekend to speak with us and our audience about this some more. So for anybody who wants to keep in touch and follow either of you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Uh, Andrew, how about you first? So you can find me pretty much everywhere as Andrew Godwin, but in particular Twitter, um, where I do a lot of my slightly inane tweeting, but often about Python as well. Um, and also you can find channels and all my other work on GitHub under Andrew Godwin as well. And Corey, how about you? Uh, unlike Andrew, I like to keep people on their toes. So on Twitter, I am Lukasa Oz, L-U-K-A-S-A-O-Z. Uh, and on GitHub, I'm Lukasa, L-U-K-A-S-A. So if you're interested in my code, uh, strip the final two characters. If you're interested in uh, hearing me express my opinions very strongly, then keep the final two characters there. Very good. And with that, we will move on into the picks. And for my first pick today, and only pick this week, I'm going to choose the Discourse forum software. So this was created by Jeff Atwood, who was also behind Stack Overflow, which every programmer should know and love by now. And Discourse is by far the most advanced and well-put-together forum software that I have seen of late. It is written on Ruby on Rails with an Ember front end, uh, but it's very easily deployed. They've got a Docker container that you can just download and run on your server. That's actually what we're using for our community forum. So again, for anybody who wants to join that, it's discourse.pythonpodcast.com. And you can try out Discourse for yourself and perhaps deploy it for your own purposes. And Chris, I'll pass it on to you now. Thanks, Tobias. Uh, I have a few this week, but uh, three of them are going to be super quick, so I won't, will not be taking up too much time. The first is a TV series. I'm kind of shocked my own self saying this because the sci-fi channel, since they changed their name to SYFY, has been just producing utter dreck in my opinion. But this series is top notch. It's called The Expanse. The writing is great. It came from a book. I haven't read the book yet. I definitely want to. The production values are very high. Uh, really great special effects. The acting is good. The story is really compelling. It's, it is, uh, I'm quoting someone else here, some of the best um, science fiction on, on mainstream television right now by a, by a long margin. So definitely check that out if you're at all inclined. Um, my next three picks are board games that have been converted to the mobile platform, and I specifically in, in my case. Uh, I've been getting more into board games lately. I feel like sort of, you know, learning how to strategize will be good for my, you know, overall self and perhaps for my tech career. Uh, and also, it's just a hell of a lot of fun. Um, so the first one is Puerto Rico for iOS. It is a really nice adaptation of the board game. The board game has, you know, a fair bit of depth and the iOS port really sort of, you know, shows that, that all through. Um, it's a board game about running your, you know, your own little version of the Puerto Rico colony in the time of, of the you know, when when uh, when that was new, essentially, and managing resources and plantations, and it's just great fun. And there's good tutorials in the iOS versions of all these as well. So if you don't know how to play the board game or even want to know how to play the board game, the iOS version is a great sort of gateway drug to get you going. Um, Dominion is the next one. I've already reviewed that on this podcast, picked it, so I won't go into any more detail, but the iOS version of that card game is excellent. Um 
And the last one is a card game uh, that they've um, made an iOS version of called Splendor, which is all about sort of building up a trove of of treasure and precious uh, gems and attracting the attention of nobles. Uh, All of these are really great sort of, you know, in my opinion, sort of free time slash commute kind of thing because they're turn based. So it's not like Twitch oriented. So if you're on the subway or something, you can you can play and get a good deal of enjoyment out of it. So that's it for me for picks. Corey, what do you have for us? Uh, so I have three, and they're all very varied, um, but uh, I wanted to just go through them real quick. Um, so the first one is, uh, I'm going really out off, off the rails here, I'm going to talk quickly about knives. So um, I, I like cooking, cooking's great fun, but uh, for the longest time I've been really, really fixated and obsessed on having the best kitchen knife I can have. Um, I've got various different reasons for this, but the main one is that uh, good kitchen knives make cooking a lot easier and a lot more enjoyable. Uh, and they're also a massive safety tool. Like having a really sharp knife actually perplexingly makes you less likely to cut yourself because the knife's less likely to slide all over the place. And uh, I have finally found a set of knives that I really love, uh, which are made by uh, Wusthof, a German knife manufacturer. So if you cook a lot at all, uh, you should take a look at, at Wusthof knives. Uh, go check them out there. Not enormously expensive, but they are fantastic. And ideally, uh, they're the kind of thing that you'll buy once and then will uh, work for the rest of your life and you'll never need to replace. Uh, Second one is sports related. We were talking about sports uh, pre-show and I was talking about how I think there's a a new renaissance in sports interest for geeks. And for that, I want to recommend all the listeners to this podcast who don't know anything about Australia, uh, which is probably most of you, that the Australian Football League sports season is starting in March, and Australian football is the most bonkers sport you will ever see. Uh, if you want an idea of what it's like, you should go to YouTube and Google uh, AFL or Australian Rules Football, uh, and you'll see there'll be some kind of 10-minute clips put together. Uh, it is utter craziness. It is absolutely fantastic, and you should watch it, because uh, it's just absurdly enjoyable. And then the final one, in a much more kind of expected topic for the, this kind of podcast uh, is uh, video games related, which is that XCOM 2 comes out uh, at the start of February, February the 5th or something, uh, and it's going to be absolutely fantastic. And I have not been, I've never been more excited for a video game in my entire life. Uh, so I find myself watching everything I can about it. So uh, I c- couldn't recommend that more. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, so I just have a couple today. Um, mine are a bit more general. So first of all, I wanted to uh, share with the audience my uh, particular passion for archery. Um, so if you've not done archery as a sport, it's this fantastic thing where it works very well as both like a sort of a solo, relaxing, do-it-yourself thing, but also in friendly groups with people. Um, it's very easy to get into. The equipment isn't that expensive usually for, for an entry bow. And most cities have an archery club, so... Um, I've been doing archery now for like three or four years and I encourage anyone who's listening who's at least interested to go along. Most clubs have a thing where you can just have a go and have, have a try out at it. And it's a sport with a really nice progression. Like you get much, much, much better very quickly in your first, say, four or five months. And if you stick at it, you can get better and better and just keep going. So it's a really nice sort of gentle upslope there. Um, and my second one is, uh, calling back to where I was two years ago today, um, I would like to call out the wonderful city of uh, Tromso in Norway, um, which is a rather odd pick because maybe people can't get there. But it's, I mean, the Arctic Circle in general this time of year is fantastic. And um, if you go up to Tromso or anywhere in, inside the Arctic Circle this time of year, you get the most wonderful um, sunsets and sunrises. Like, you know, there's only two, two hours of sunlight, but there are two hours of sunset and two hours of sunrise as well. And that plus the Northern Lights, I encourage anyone who's, feels that they have the means and the ability to go up north to at least have a go well again we definitely appreciate the both of you joining us and i'm sure that our listeners will get a great deal of enjoyment learning more about the whiskey specification and some of its proposed advancements and they hope you enjoy the rest of your weekends thank it's you been a pleasure thanks for having us thanks guys Bye bye <laughs>